Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, it's a real honor to be here. I'm a huge fan of everything that Creative Mornings does. And um, Alicia, the founder, is one of my favorite people in the entire world. And actually, um, you know, she and I were talking before uh, the performance and, you know, talking about sort of the magic of how things come together. And everyone in this audience should know that, you know, what she does to put this event together every month is really magic. Um, so just wanted to give her a shout out. But um, yeah, I'd like to kick off the conversation by asking some of these people up here um, who I really admire, I've interviewed, I would consider them friends as well, how they would define magic. Because I know for me, in my personal life and as far as my profession goes, magic is how everything comes together, you know? I mean, I feel like the best things that have happened to me as far as my book or, you know, getting an art exhibition in the airport, um, many of the other things, uh, you know, it's been all due to serendipity and just sort of remaining open to, um, you know, what other people would call the impossible. So, um, Nathan, we can start off with you. Yeah, hi. How's everybody doing? So, what's the question? How would you define magic? Uh, I mean, it's simple for me. I think magic is having the natural ability to do something that, you know, either can't be taught directly or is very hard to teach somebody. Um, I mean, that's how I've always perceived what I've done. I, I feel like I have some kind of natural ability to do the things that I do, and that sounds kind of egotistical, but... Um, <laughs> But just going with that, like just letting things kind of flow and, and whatever that is that happens when you do that, um, it seems like it's, that's a natural ability. I mean, that seems like magic to me. Uh, things happening that, I don't know. I mean, that's all I can explain as far as that goes. Yeah, that I, sounds, mean, I, I, would, I would definitely say that's true. What about you, Elizabeth? Um, you know, I'm not gonna be able to get this mic off. You could be like a rock star and just hold it right there. Yeah. So when I think about magic, for me, what magic has been is um, retroactive, right? Looking back and understanding that so much of the random things that I did that seemed to have no purpose or meaning at the time have come together to create um, a meaningful life, a career that I really love, and the freedom to take a path that was not one that existed and uh, for me, to walk and find another path. And looking back, I can see that all of the things that seem like irresponsible, crazy decisions um, were actually really good ones because they got me here. So that act of looking back and making meaning, that's magic for me. For me, magic is, uh... It's kind of synonymous with the word creativity, except there's no illusions. Uh, there's no tricks, there's no uh, guides, you know, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. It's, uh, for me, the arts is, uh, the arts are the, the real magic. Uh, creating something, anything out of your unique uh, perspective is magic. And, um, and yeah, just um, um, kind of, Everything from, um, you know, coming up with an idea that you didn't have before or sitting down having a conversation with a friend and coming up with, um, you know, more ideas or the creative process. I think there's magic and all those little things that kind of work out for the better. Um, and then <coughs> even in the final piece, you know, it's, it's magic. So. So um, I was thinking about kind of how to introduce everyone, but I usually like to let people introduce themselves. Usually I can't phrase it any better than they do. But um, really the reason that I selected all these people was they have pretty magical paths to their current career. You know, Nathan was a pro skateboarder turned event producer and visual artist. Um, I'm sure you've seen his murals all around town. They're fantastic. Elizabeth was a college dropout. Now she is the executive director of the Vanderbilt Curb Center, um, as well as a professor. Um, and then Isan, you had worked um, at the Tennessean, I know, in which you said just the office environment wasn't the right fit for you, which I'm sure for many of you in the audience, you would agree with that. And now you have um, your own blog and website and have gained a lot of traction with that. So I'm curious if you guys could tell a little bit about 
how you got to your current career path and you know what it was like to just sort of trust the universe and go with the flow. Well, my career path started like when I was in high school. Uh, I was doing a lot of skateboarding at the time, and I was not a pro skateboarder, I was a semi-pro skateboarder. <laughs> Never had my name on a board, but uh, enough to get by and make a living you know, at a young age and got to travel all over the place. And with those travels, I met a lot of people from many different backgrounds. And any city that I would arrive in, I would have like you know, 20 immediate friends that were all skateboarders. And you know, maybe we wouldn't hang out outside of skateboarding, but you know, we had that one thing together. And, and because of that, um, you know, as I grew older and you know, was trying to go to school, uh, a lot of those people stuck around. And they became creative directors and you know, designers and artists and all these, you know, had all these cool backgrounds. And uh, I don't know, I kind of built relationships with them and they became resources for the things that I was wanting to do. And I, I fell into a street marketing role where I started a company at a young age and uh, quit school after two semesters and that was like the next eight years of my life. And a lot of those people that I met through skateboarding and, and uh, they, they, they were like my resources and I just built a massive resource pool from, from those years. I mean skateboarding and I used to do graffiti, I used to paint trains and do all that kind of stuff too. Uh, all those things, all those people played a role uh, with what I do now. I mean, yeah. Uh, Elizabeth? Um, so how did I get here um, from being a college dropout? Uh, I dropped out of college when I was 19 and then I went and worked in New York for a couple of years in the Garment Center. I went back to school, I got my bachelor's degree. I worked for a year in a law firm that advocated for children on, um, uh, on the spectrum um, to get their rights from various school boards. And then I just went and taught in New York City public schools for three years, which is a really challenging job, and decided to get my doctorate, came to Vanderbilt, left Vanderbilt after I got my doctorate, taught at Mount Holyoke College, which is a women's college, and then came back for this job at the Curb Center, which is fascinating because I get to teach, I still teach in the English department, but I also get to do stuff that's way outside my field of Victorian literature, um, leading the Creative Campus Initiative. And I really agree with you thinking that making or creativity is the magic, whether it's you're making meaning or understanding. And, um, I was, telling, I was telling Nathan this story about like, you know, when I was a kid, I went to, um, or what, did I tell you the story? I was, wake, I was a kid and I went to a, a Night of Nations event at a local uh, uh, residence hall for international students. I got my fortune told. And um, I was around 14 or 15, maybe 16. And this fortune to teller told me that I was going to die young and tragically in my 30s. I think you told and me I that story. Like, and I was like, huh, well, um, no retirement planning, don't need to think about buying a house, children, <laughs> marriage. I can do anything I want to do because I have no future. So it's great. <laughs> so, and it, it's terribly morbid. No fortune teller who wants to make money should do this. But, um, but it was incredibly freeing because I'd never had to say, I'm going to do this by the time I'm 35. I'm going to do this by the time I'm 40. Um, I, I happen to have made it a little longer than that. I'm now 48, not 32, so I'm a little bit stuck as to figuring out what to do. <laughs> but um, the point being that that moment was a moment, looking back, where it was like, you're free to do anything you want because you don't have to fit into any of the stories anybody else has for what life should be. So that's how I got where I am. I love that. You're right, more fortune tellers should do that, honestly. <laughs> They'd be breaking it in. So I graduated from UT Chattanooga, go Mox, in 2013, and um, came back to Franklin, where I was raised for the most part, and uh, walked into the Tennessean office one day and said, hey, talked to the editor, and I was like, I, I want to freelance, I want to write. So he said, pitch me a story. I did, and uh, they gave me an opportunity, and that is where I found my passion for storytelling, uh, and for community, and for sitting down and having a conversation with people. Um, and so I accepted a position with the Tennessee, and I realized, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing for me. So after a lot of conversations with friends and other things um, happening kind of all at once, uh, I got a camera, uh, a DSLR camera. Uh, a friend of mine 
and I were, kind of, were going to come up with this idea for a magazine of kind of sharing people's stories, something similar, um, but just never really put something down on it. He ended up joining a band. Uh, and so I kind of took, the, yeah, so Nashville. <laughs> that is so Nashville. <laughs> so I, uh, I ended up taking the idea on my own and just things just fell into place. The name, the, uh, the friends, the network, uh, the community, just it happened um, almost magically. Uh, and so it, uh, almost two years now, it's, uh, it's been just an incredible, incredible journey, so. Love that. Well, um, you know, it was interesting when I was kind of laying on my couch the last couple of days trying to come up with questions. What kept coming to me, um, and, and this is just my personal definition of magic, but I always think of magic in terms of superpowers, you know? I think that for me, um, you know, people tend to say I'm a really good listener and I tend to really get them and, um, you know, it's for me is a great gift and I don't know if it's innate or learned, it just is what it is. Um, but as my best friend, Laura Lee Goldberg coined it, you know, she said, you're kind of like the people whisperer. People tend to, you know, just sort of really open up and be themselves with you. So I'm curious for you guys, what would you consider to be your superpower? Um, I, <laughs> I, I'd say, I mean, one thing that I've noticed with many career changes and paths, um, I've been able to do everything that I've wanted to do, no matter what that meant financially or whatever. Anything that I was determined to do, I, I made happen so far. There hasn't been anything that I completely, totally failed at. I've had failures with each thing, but I mean, it's all learning experience, and I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd say that it feels like a superpower or magical. Um, and I'm also really good at easing people's tempers and remaining calm in the craziest moments. Um, I, somebody told me that this past weekend when I was producing a festival for a bunch of crazy rappers. <laughs> I, it, was, it was intense and it was, you know, it was supposed to be canceled, it was raining, there's like 10 people performing. There's dudes on motorcycles, you know, doing stunts, and it was, it, was, it was a circus. And I had a lot of people tell me that like, you're really good at doing that. You're good, you eased everybody's, you calmed everybody down when they were screaming and being divas. Um, I think those might be, I don't know, those two things seem to have uh, been a, a constant for me. Yeah. Um, superpower, I can fly, um, <laughs> of course. Um, everybody does that. I, I help people make connections. I think I do that in my teaching. I think that I do that in the work with my Curb Scholars, and I do that in my work sort of uh, with Vanderbilt and the community surrounding us. I help people make connections, and, um, and I think part of that is helping them see how what they're thinking about or doing is related to both the um, larger context of their work and also to the people that they work with. So, um, and that's, I think that's again part of that meaning making thing, that looking back and saying, oh, this is, this is connected to this, that, and the other thing, and that's why it makes sense that this is what I do. Wait, what was the question? What's your superpower? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ethan, pay attention. <laughs> I fly as well. Uh, I think storytelling is my is my superpower. Um, I love sitting down, having a conversation with people, getting coffee, just hearing their story. Uh, I have a passion for it. It's something that I I hope that I'm I'm good at, um, and something that I hope people can uh, something that people can learn from and can understand. Uh, that learning each other's story is not only important, but powerful. We connect, and we can connect so many things together. We can build bridges. We can strengthen uh, better relationships in the community if we share each other's story. Uh, so I hope that I do that well, and I hope that's my superpower. So, you know, it was interesting. Over the last week, I kind of realized that there are certain words that are, um, I don't know if they're provocative or not, but they, they tend to elicit different 
you know, responses and reactions from people. And um, magic was certainly one of them. I was telling these guys up here, you know, people said everything from, you know, magic, playing with the Ouija board. I'm like, what kind of messed up stuff are you into, you know? Or, um, you know, they kind of referenced, obviously, traditional witchcraft. And then I think a lot of people sort of tend to think about it in the sense that we're talking about, which is, you know, serendipity. Um, so I'm curious, from your perspective, why do you think people tend to not trust themselves or trust maybe things kind of unfolding naturally, you know? I know that for me, like when I tell people I don't have like a five-year plan or, you know, I just kind of, as Nathan put it earlier, like I'm just sort of seeing what's going to happen and go with the flow. Um, I, people look at me like I'm kind of crazy, honestly. Yeah, I mean, so recently I've decided to sell my house in a year and literally just go travel and do art-related projects all over the world because um, A, I have a window to do it, and B, why the hell not? You know, if you have an opportunity to cash in on something, you can always buy a house, you can always do these things, and um, that's been like a very motivating thing for me once I've figured out that I can kind of do whatever the hell I want. Um, as long as I'm doing the good things in the world, I don't feel bad about just not doing the norm or not having that nine to five, and um, I think it's really important to kind of figure that out, you know, a, figure yourself out, and um, and yeah, I mean, just kind of do what you do, no matter what that means. You know, like you might have parents that like say you got to do this and that, and that's really important. You got to please them, but um, you know, pleasing yourself and doing what you feel like you're supposed to do in this world is probably the most important thing. I feel like I've figured that out somewhat um, just in the past few years. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, first of all, I, like, I acknowledge that I am immensely privileged to be in the position where I can do things that I want to do, because I think there's a huge amount of people in the world who don't, who, for reasons of geography, social economic reasons um, in the U.S., that, that don't have that set of opportunities where they can say, I can do what I want. But the reason, I think the reason people don't feel free to pursue that sort of, you know, um, waiting to see what happens is... Uh, stories that are already written. I mean, I think the stories have immense power when we are telling our own stories, when we are trying to fit into other people's narratives of what we should be or do. Um, we have, a, it's constraining. And um, a lot of the students I work with at Vanderbilt, um, they have, they also come from, many of them come from high pressure backgrounds where they feel that any misstep, if you step off that path, that is a failure instead of an adventure, right? They think that that's a loss, not an adding to. So I think thinking about the path that you're taking or the story that's already written as something that you can add to by diverging from it is a way to ch transform that thinking of, no, 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 you have to have your five-year plan into, you, have, you can have your five-year plan, but if you diverge from it, that's probably even better, right? Because um, that's genuine sort of growth and, and sort of organic and happening in the moment. So. I would definitely agree. I think that's something that I've learned just within the last uh, few years with this project is that just because something else doesn't work out doesn't mean that it's a failure. It means that it's an adventure. And I, that's, I love the way you put that. Uh, but I think a lot of people are scared of not wanting to kind of venture out because it is scary. You're kind of putting yourself out there as a creative person, as an artist, just as a human being who has a passion for something. It's, uh, it's terrifying. Um, you, could, you know, because you could fail and you could quote unquote fail, um, but it's always a learning experience at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I think that's why. Um, but I think once people begin to trust themselves and trust the process and maybe trust a little bit of that magic, you begin to realize that it, this is an adventure and there's going to be more opportunities. There's going to be more things that are always going to come up. So it's, uh, it's just, it's going with the flow and knowing and trusting yourself at the end of the day. And I think, you know, having dropped out of college in, in my, the first time in my second year, like for, for my family, there was no greater failure. You know, I mean, my father was a college professor. My mother, um, my mother was the Asian tiger mother. And so this was not good. Like I had shamed her in front of her family. So, so I had already failed. Like I had already failed on every level that mattered to my family. I was 19. What worse could I do, right? I had already failed and I'd been told I was gonna die in 13 years. So 
You had it rough. So, so no, but I, but I was free. Again, I was free, right? Because, like, after that, like, I didn't die. You know, like, nothing bad happened. I was able to get a job. I was able to have friends. I was able to have a fun life. I should probably have done more adventuring, right? Mm -hmm. More adventuring would have been even better. But once you make that first step off that path and realize that that failure is opening up new possibilities, you know, every single time you do that, you open up new possibilities, but the first time is the hardest, and then you realize that it's not going to destroy you. You will still have good things after that. And I think that's crucial, is that first step. Absolutely. So I think, um, you know, it, it was interesting, this question just kind of popped into my head when you guys were all talking, but how do you get back to that point of, you know, like trusting yourself? Like I know for me last week, you know, I, w I had kind of a rough couple of weeks and I said, screw it, I'm going to go see my family. They always kind of ground me, you know, they live in Florida. It's great. I'm going to go hang out on the beach for four days. And so when I was there, you know, I was doing a lot of soul searching and I remember I had a moment where I thought I need some money, like I need some more money and I don't know where it's going to come from, but it's going to fall from the sky. And literally I came back and the day after I came back to Nashville, someone said to me, Hey, you know, I really love what you wrote about me. Here's a hundred bucks. And they just handed it to me. And I thought, well, there you go. I mean, because I, maybe it was because I didn't put like any sort of parameters or restrictions on it, you know? So for you guys, do you have some sort of, I don't know, I mean, a special thing that you do to bring yourself back to that point of trusting? Is, are you superstitious at all? I, I don't, I'm not really superstitious. Um, I, a few years ago, I kind of lost everything and was taking care of family and sort of had a, had a full restart at, you know, 32. And that is, I mean, that, that kind of came into play. Your question was, it, I had to learn how to trust myself and my ability, already, I'd already been pretty successful at a young age and it was time to like reconfigure everything and start over from scratch. And the only thing I could do is trust myself because I mean, I was taking care of everybody else and I was like, well, it's up to me make all this happen and realizing that yeah I mean it, it well a put a lot of things back in perspective and you know show me what's really important and that's the moment where I was like I'm gonna do nothing but creative work no matter what that is whether it's producing an event for some big brand or if it's you know doing a big mural or whatever it is um, that's all I'm gonna do with the rest of my life and I don't know I love that I love hearing like I'm gonna do the thing that makes me you know happy and that works for me. Um, I don't know, I think I have a little bit more fear now because I have a kid and that's challenging. Um, but when, I guess faith in the, in, the, in the value of the work I do, like a belief that I'm doing a good job and that, that positive change will happen. So I mean, um, when you get your PhD in English literature, everybody tells you there's no jobs out there and everybody, every PhD <laughs> thinks, oh no, there'll be a job for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's no tenure track jobs, you're not gonna get all this stuff and this is you know, sort of distinct to the PhD market in the humanities, but I, I realized I went in and I was like, okay, I'm gonna have a PhD in English and nowhere to go with that. Like that's okay because I can find something else to do and be willing to, again, to reroute. So I think, the, willing, the recognition that, the, that I have ability to do a lot of different things and that if that one doesn't work out, that's fine. I can find something else to do. Um, I have enough, I'm pretty confident in my ability to find work that's both meaningful and that other people will see the value of. So. For me, it's kind of, again, taking a break. Um, I love, personally, I love traveling. I love exploring. I love hiking, I love being outside, so anytime I'm away from my work or doing something else, um, if I'm away for too long, it, it draws me back, always. Um, there's always a time I want to um, tell stories and, and meet new people and connect with new people um, and write and listen. Um, so yeah, for me, that's what really kind of recharges me sometimes when you know things don't work out or um, you know, something happens, um, so I think that's what it is for me, it's just kind of taking some time away, really almost waiting for it to call me back, um, 
which doesn't take too long usually. Um, and then going back to it with a clear mind and an, and an open heart to it. So I just have one last question for you guys, and then as always, I'm going to turn it over to the audience for Q and A for the last ten minutes. But um, you know, I always tell people, um, you know, that book that I wrote that's back there, and it's on Amazon if anyone wants to buy it. Um, <laughs> you know, it, I felt like the luckiest person in the world when I was creating it, and now that I'm working on my follow-up project, um, I feel even luckier. Um, you know, because basically I've kind of built this career around. Um, you know, I joke I built a career around telling people my problems. That's not the truth. I mean. I literally get a chance to sit down and contact pretty much anyone I want and, you know, ask them questions that I have and, you know, it always pertains to their career, but it's always about what I'm going through at the moment. I mean, it's entirely selfish um, and, you know, I've gotten some great advice and the second I started collecting that great advice, I decided to put it into a book format and share it with other people. And so. Um, I'm curious for you three, what is some, you know, magical advice someone gave you at some point in time? I mean, I'll offer mine. I mean, the best advice anyone ever gave me was to not take myself too seriously and to have some detachment from my work. Um, and I think that was highly transformative for me because I used to be that kind of person where I would um, so define myself as an artist and you know when something wouldn't work out I would be like crushed because you know all of my self-worth was tied up in it and then the second I was like screw that you know I have other interests and I like doing other things and you know it's that's not my whole life um, I think actually the best stuff started happening right after that I made that decision yeah. I, this has been like a pinnacle moment where somebody gave me advice and I was like oh you know that's the rest of my life there I know what I'm doing <laughs> It was, it was more like, I mean, there was one thing, somebody told me one time, said, ain't nothing free. And that's always stuck with me for some reason. I mean, because if you think about it, like, you do have to work for everything. Or, you know, most people do. And, and that, for some reason, stuck with me. And then uh, the other thing, a friend of mine just said, don't worry about it. I was, like, stressing over some project or something like that. And they just snapped me out of it. And, I mean not worrying about something too much, not stressing over something too much, not overthinking something too much. It's like, don't worry about it. Like, you're good at what you do. Keep doing that. And it'll, things, things will happen. You'll get through it. Um, those are like the only two things that really stick out, and they've definitely been important in my life. Ain't nothing free. I don't know. <laughs> you should put that on a t-shirt. Ain't true. nothing free. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know, this is not advice from a person. This is a book that I read, and because um, I'm a super nerd and read Star Trek novels. and <laughs> So I cannot recommend this book enough. It is called The Wounded Sky. It is by Diane Duane, and it is amazing. <laughs> um, and she's also clearly read a lot of science fiction and fantasy and sort of incorporated into this Star Trek novel. This is definitely embarrassing, confessing this. <laughs> but um, one of the things in this novel is uh, you put good energy into the universe, good energy comes back. And, and you know, it's wrapped up in a lot of other stuff with a glass spider and creative physics, but basically that's what it is. And like, you won't recognize the form it comes back to you in, but that's what you do. You try hard and you be kind, right? And that's it. You know. It's hard to do that sometimes, because sometimes you're mad and, like, for me, sometimes I'm mad and bitchy, but <laughs> I am. But you remember, you try hard and you be kind. Yeah. True. So, that's good. Because it ain't nothing for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's two things that I've really, um, I've kind of seen a lot, um, just kind of, I guess, around in the world, in books and in media. Uh, there's one thing that I see a lot and it says, uh, don't be so easily defined. <clears throat> and that's something I love because people always want to, I feel, maybe like put you in a box or say, this is what you do. You know, they try to put a label on you or say, this is what you do, this is what you are. Um, but I enjoy that flexibility of being an artist and just creating whatever it is. Um, and just knowing that I can do pretty much anything, you know, that I put my, my heart to. Uh, with a little bit, with a little bit of help um, from some magic, um, and then another thing is, uh, in order to do, in order to get something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done, and that's really uh, impacted me a lot in my work because 
I've never started a blog before. I've never um, started a business. I've never uh, even called myself an artist before. Um, so just taking that chance and doing something new and seeing what happens because of it um, is, is pretty cool and awesome. I love that. Well, um, we have about 10 minutes left, guys. I would love to turn this over to the audience if anyone has any questions about magic or any of these wonderful people. Yes? Hey, so um, in the creative community, I know we talk a lot about these concepts of creativity and magic um, and tend to really prize them. And, and I, I think we'd all agree that they also take a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I'm wondering, how do you guys each put the work in? Like, on a daily practical level, mm -hmm. how do you manufacture that magic and creativity? For me, it's getting up early, 5 o'clock, every morning, doing some writing, doing some reading, doing some researching, uh, doing some planning, uh, and just, and writing, and just putting the pen to the paper, putting my fingers on the, um, on the keyboard, and just letting go, and seeing what happens. I think for me, I mean, it's always been having multiple streams of income. I mean, I really feel like that's something that artistic people don't talk enough about, but I mean, you know, I'm 29, I've worked in the service industry since I was 17, and I'm damn proud of it. I mean, because for me, it's like, I know that I'm going to be able to pay my rent every month, and it doesn't make me any less of a writer or a live inter interviewer or a people whisperer or whatever people tend to call me, you know, just because I, you know, also know how to make a really good drink or to, you know, seat someone at a table. And I think that, so many artists have this perception that, you know, if they're not doing photography or visual arts or, you know, event production or whatever full time, that they're not that. And that's just not true. I mean, it's just a really hard, weird time that we live in. And everyone wants everything for free these days. And it's like, I think that as much as we can talk about magic up here, I mean, I'm also really into talking about the concrete. And, you know, the reality is, if you don't come from, you know, a trust fund, then you need to be making money. And so, I mean, I think for me, it's like, once I accepted the fact that I would probably always have to be a hustler, always have to get up super early. I don't wake up at five, Isan, you're crazy. I mean, my God, I wake up at like 6.30 maybe. But, um, you know, and then just, uh, just kind of do what you gotta do to do your art. Yeah, definitely, I've, <laughs> whatever with this. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've always, I've made sure that with anything that I accept as far as work or whatever it is, I have to do it and see it through no matter what. No matter if it takes me a thousand hours, it should have taken, I promise, two hours to get done or whatever it is, I have to see it through even if I'm doing, you know, like the other day I was painting a 100 foot by 30 foot tall mural while trying to produce a festival on a ladder 20 something feet up, you know, talking to like managers of artists. And it was like, I had to do it no matter what. I can't, I don't want to let, let anybody down. But that's always been something for me. I, I see every, everything through, no matter what, no matter what it takes, blood, sweat, and tears all day long. And I think if you commit to if you commit to somebody else, that's a really good sort of keeping yourself honest way of getting creative work done. So I mean, for writing, you got to make your date with your tool, whatever that is, whether it's your hand and your pen or your computer. You got to make your date and you got to keep it because the muse gets used to a schedule, and um, mm -hmm. not that I. It, so you need to be there because. 90% of the time, it's going to be a slog, but you need to be there in case that 10% happens. But the other thing that you have to do is you have to commit to people because I will, I will happily sort of let myself down sometimes, but if I feel like I'm letting down other people that I've committed to, that I work with, that I value, I don't do that because you got to work hard and you got to try hard and be kind. And part of being kind is if you commit, you commit and you get it done. I think that helps me. That's policing me, you know? Totally. Anyone else have any questions? Yes. For you, Lily, I was just curious. You said you now have the opportunity to pretty much sit down with whoever you want to talk to. That was probably an overstatement, by the way. I tend to exaggerate a lot of the time. <laughs> anyway. But before this book came out, before anyone sort of knew who you were, sure. um, did you find it difficult, and how did you overcome people's hesitance to 
you know, who is this random stranger who wants to sit down and ask me into my question? What did you say to put them at ease? Well, yeah, totally. Um, first of all, I'm very persistent. I generally get what I want. So, I mean, I just, you know, was kind of crazy, honestly. I mean, I realized that, you know, I had come here from Chicago. I did have about four years of professional writing experience. So I actually had a pretty decent portfolio when I moved here. I wasn't making a lot of money, but you know, I had a lot of celebrity interviews, a lot of editorial features. I mean, for someone who was 25 at the time, I actually had done some cool shit. Um, and so I did what anyone does. I put my best clips forward and I sold myself. And you know, I just was kind of at the point in the game where I was like, you know, um, when you have nothing to lose, then, you know, why not? Why not go for it? I didn't know anyone here. I knew my photographer, Joshua Black Wilkins, and I knew he would support me no matter what. Um, and that was kind of all I really needed. I was just sort of bored and desperate, honestly. And so I think that that um, almost like not caring really what other people thought was what kind of got me through it. And you know, I mean, as an artist, you get rejected all the time. I mean, and also I came from the service industry where you're like constantly facing rejection or like weird situations where you're having to like sell yourself on someone. So for me to get like shot down by like an interviewee, which did happen, and I can think of one in particular who literally wrote me back and said, I have no idea who you are. This sounds like the stupidest book ever. Why would Jason Isabel want to be in this book? And I said, okay. I said, well, um, you know, whatever. Like I'm not gonna take it personally. And I think realizing if someone rejected my project, it didn't mean that they were rejecting me. I think we have time for one more question. The back? Order up. Yeah. <laughs> when you're young and you feel directionless and you're not really sure if something's going to work out, what motivates you to keep going? Like, what makes you sure that it's going to work out you know, by the time you're in your late 20s or 30s or 40s? Are you sure that it's going to work out? <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, your face was priceless. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I never was sure things were going to like, but I mean, you know, there was never any guarantee, but um, for one thing that motivated me to keep going and whatever I was doing at the time was there was the rent that had to get paid. But the other thing was that not thinking that, not thinking, I guess, let me reframe that. I was not ever sure things were going to work out and it was going to make sense. The magic came when I realized that it only looking backwards did it make sense. So at any time looking forward, I'm sort of like, mm, I don't know. But when I turn around and I look back and I can see like where I am now and how I got there, then it starts to make sense. Um, I think it's living in the future perfect tense. By the time I get there, I will have figured something out. <laughs> something, right? So for me, that's teacher. Works. Yeah, yeah. future perfect. She's gonna give us a grammar lesson, you guys. <laughs> future perfect. I will have figured something out. That's all. I mean, I don't know if that's helpful. I completely agree. I don't. I don't think there's ever a time when I fully know that this is gonna work out. Even five, three, two years from now, um, something could happen. Anything could happen. Um, and I pick and choose a different direction, and that's okay. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I think those little those little steps of or those little things that do work out kind of show you. Okay, you're you're kind of doing something right here. Keep it going, or um, you know, when when something you think would never work out and you get a great opportunity um, to do something really cool, then um, you know, it's those things that kind of show you that okay, I'm on the right track here. I'm I'm not going to give this up. I'm not going to you know I'm not going to put this down. You know, I think the thing, that I, the thing that I hate most of any thing that I do and any work that I do is jobs that I call housekeeping. Because you do it like you scrub the floor, you just know you're going to have to scrub it again. You clean the bathtub, you just know you're going to have to clean it again. Um, those things, when you find that everything feels like that, like there's no sort of there there, like then I think you, you're sort of like, okay, I need to do something that's not just this. Housekeeping is necessary, we all have to do it, but for God's sake, let's not have all of our life be housekeeping, unless housekeeping gives you joy. And for people <laughs> for whom that is true, great, come talk to me, I've got a house. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but but yeah, so like the things like those moments where you're like, uh, as Ethan was saying, like you get that moment where wow, that was amazing. I that that one moment, and then I can keep going doing some more housekeeping for a little while. Right. Yeah. Do I have to talk? <laughs> uh, Keep it short. <laughs> no, I mean I, I agree with both of what they said. I mean it, it is. I mean w with me, I found I was good at skateboarding, and that led to producing events and doing all these big marketing campaigns. I don't know how that even relates, but it did. Um, you know, you find that one thing that you you're pretty good at, it could transfer over to you know many areas of your life. Um, at least for me, that was my experience. I, mean, I didn't know what the hell I was doing when I was 16, and I found a sport that uh, that I like doing. And it's 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 I still skateboard. I built a half pipe in my backyard a couple months ago. Why not? <laughs> 39. Who cares? Uh, and yeah, I mean, like it, you know, like where you're asking, you don't know what you're doing. What I do, just you know, there's something. Everybody has something that they're slightly good at or interested in learning more about. Don't be scared. Who cares? Like just, just go with whatever you know. You're 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 feeling it, whether it's at that moment or something you felt for a long time. Just don't be don't be scared. Everybody's scared. I get it. I've been there. But, you just yeah. do the next right thing. Yeah. There'll be another one after that. True. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys. Thank you.